uh, welcome everyone to the REAMP Network Lunch and Learn webinar. Um, today's presentation is on city gas infrastructure and policy. And we are joined by John Farrell um, the, of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and the Energy Democracy Initiative and Carl Rabago from Pace University Energy and Climate Center. Um, so today's conversation, just a little brief outline. We do some welcome updates and context setting. We'll talk about gas regulation basics, cities and gas, economics of gas, policy solutions, and then uh, open it up to question and answer. I will kick it off to Carl. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Abby. Um, so thank you everyone for signing up to be a participant on this and for um, listening to us and hopefully discussing with us some of these fun issues about gas. Um, one important note just up front, you'll notice the convention we use is the word gas, which is short for methane gas. And we're kind of um, not too heavily dependent on the use natural gas, which is a, a kind of a marketing term um, <laughs> that, that has gone on over the last several decades. But that's what we mean when we talk about it. Um, what I'm going to do, as, as he has already said, is give you an introduction and an overview, some things to understand about the gas industry and, and how it affects, affects our lives, especially in cities, and then open up uh, to a list of ideas that are available to cities that want to get busy on decarbonization. So Abby, go ahead and take the next slide and we'll start the process. Um, so the first thing I want to do is make sure that everybody has a, at least a good basic baseline of knowledge. Um, and it's important to understand that natural gas is very unregulated. Uh, we've allowed the market forces to take over in a lot of issues in production and pipelines and the compression, which is what's necessary to move gas through pipelines, um, in storage, which, which can happen in giant caverns or in big mechanical structures and banks, and then ultimately in delivery to a city gate. When it comes to cities, cities are served by LDCs. And I'm afraid, by the way, that if you're gonna get into this gas business, you're gonna get into a new set of acronyms um, good news, I've got you uh, a tool that can help you get through it. LDCs, here's the technical definition. An LDC is a local distribution company. So it's the entity that receives gas at the city gate, when we're talking about cities, and that's defined below, and then distributes it through a se series of smaller pipes and valves and pressure stations, up ultimately to your home or business, so it can be used at a burner tip. There are some customers who take gas at high level, meaning they take it straight off of a transmission line and they're non-LDC customers. And there could be some of those located right in your own city. I'll give you an example. When I was in, uh, lived in Austin, Texas, the University of Texas had several transmission level gas lines coming in and the campus acted as, as its own LDC. So as you wanna get into the issues of how gas works in the community where you live, you need to understand the basic architecture. Who's served by the LDC and who takes gas at the transmission level? Um, for those of us, we're gonna be served at the city gate. And uh, everything that happens behind the city gate is potentially subject to the regulatory options that we're gonna talk about. Um, lastly, getting through the gobbledygook on, on gas terminology, EIA, at least for now, still has a good glossary, objective, reliable. So you're freezing up a little, so you might have to repeat some of this. Yeah, I noticed that. Okay. You, could, you could turn off your yeah. video since people are looking at the slides anyway. Yep. So what, let me just tell you about it because it's a picture, and as it flips over, you'll get a chance to see it. The next slide is, is a great diagram that they call a Sankey diagram. Here it is. Um, this is really fun in terms of just understanding energy in general. And for the purposes of this call, we're focusing on the blue stuff in the middle. Um, 
31 quads of energy, and a quad is a quadrillion BTUs of gas is produced at wells or imported, but mostly produced at wells in the United States. And the blue lines show how that flow is broken down. So a third of it goes to electricity power plants, and then the rest of it goes primarily to residential, commercial, and industrial uses. You can see industrial is the next big dog with another roughly third of the gas that's used. Um, there's a tiny little blue line there that goes for those natural gas vehicles that you may have seen or heard about. Um, we're going to focus, obviously, on residential and commercial because that's most of how cities, people, and people and businesses in cities use gas. So we're looking at five quads of residential use and three plus quads of commercial use. Let's figure out what those numbers mean by going to the next slide. All right. So what is it? Well, we start with BTUs. And Look at all those zeros. <laughs> 31 quads. And remember, 5.5 goes to residential and 3.6 goes to commercial. Um, let's turn that into climate pollution. If you're looking to decarbonize, that means 602 billion pounds or 300 million tons of carbon dioxide produced by our residential consumption of gas. And you see the numbers there for commercial, 422 billion pounds or 211 million tons. And that's each year using 2018 data. And of course, if the number, if our usage goes up, those con contributions to greenhouse gas and climate change increase as well. Go to the next slide and we'll take Take that to another direction. Let's look at what the gas business is. Sorry about the blurry diagram, but this the, the diagram at the bottom of the slide recapitulates the basic business structure that I described earlier. A producer, somebody who uh, you know fracks or dr drills a gas well, the gas is moved into an interstate pipeline and then moves to that LDC acronym check again, uh, and then is distributed to an end user. And as I mentioned. There are some customers who take straight off of the pipeline because they use so much or they distribute themselves. In 2018, according to the American Gas Association, by the way, which is an excellent source of data because they're really proud of all the work they do. Um, and I've got the, I, I included the link here, but in, as, of, as of 2018, there were uh, about a million, over a million miles of gas main in the distribution system and about another million miles of what they call services. Services means the piece of equipment that connects from the gas main to your house. By the way, it's the same term they use in the electricity business. In, for those of us who have wires connecting from poles, it's the wire that goes from the pole or the last transformer to our meter. So about a million, about two million total miles of main and services and about 69 million customers, that's the count on services, receiving gas. So um, now you understand the size of the problem. Let's go to the next slide and dig in to regulation. Authority to regulate remains at all levels, cities, states, and the federal government. Working from the bottom up, the federal government is primarily is dealing with interstate, I-N-T-E-R, state gas business, transmission and siting of pipelines. States regulate gas utilities, especially gas utilities that provide service to areas that are big city alone. So the Public Service Commission or Public Utilities Commission, except Texas, and that's sort of always except Texas, um, will regulate gas utilities and gas rates. Um, and they'll also deal with wholly in-state or intrastate siting. And uh, they'll regulate utility decisions on investments in new compressor stations, pipelines, terminals, things like that. The cities, 
have what in the law business we call police power. They have the opportunity to regulate industries that affect our health, our safety, our property, um, and basically our ability to just get along. So this short list here on this slide, um, I want to, I'll dive in and then I won't repeat it on the next slide where I go into it in detail. Franchise rights, cities that are, uh, that are sort of uh, statutorily or legislatively created as proper cities have the right to dic dictate who gets to operate businesses within their city limits. That means you need a permit if you're going to operate a business. That permit, when it comes to providing utility services, is called a franchise. Uh, and it's, it's the right to provide service to all customers within a ge designated geographical area. The city can attach conditions right, and um, negotiate contracts, franchise agreements with utility providers. Uh, the local siting in the utility business is called rights of way or right of way regulation, meaning the decision about who gets to put a pipe underground or above ground or near a building or in any public space the city has the right to regulate that. The city, of course, cares about safety and the safe operation of both utilities and the appliances and equipment that uses gas. Some of that can also be done through building codes, which also include energy efficiency standards and, of course, conditions for the basic building itself. Uh, and then, of course, cities are increasingly expressing a regulatory priority around environment and climate. And it's the cities who are starting to make commitments to rapid decarbonization and total decarbonization that are of most interest for this discussion. Go to the next slide and we'll just wrap up a list of, of these things and I won't, I won't duplicate. I will, I will tell you though that the pictures here are some of the things you might see that are associated with gas. Everything from the bottom right-hand corner of people inspecting meters and mains and, um, and uh, to the people installing pipe to compressor stations, which can be small and compact in the upper left, um, can also be bigger with valves and pipes sticking around. And then, of course, through public rights of way, you may see bigger gas mains. Um, this is an issue when the gas utility wants, for example, to conduct to multiple transmission lines. They will have nodes of connection and they'll need permission and authority to, uh, from the local city and maybe the county and maybe the state for siting that equipment. So I already talked about franchise agreements and rights of way. Um, some utilities exercise direct regulation of utilities uh, by, uh, by acting as the, the regulator just like, sorry, just like a, a um, public service commission, some cities own their gas utility and operate it as a municipal enterprise. I already mentioned building codes. I want to introduce you to another topic, which is stretch codes. Um, building codes establish the minimum, sorry, I'm trying to cut down the noise here. Building codes establish the minimum requirements for buildings within a particular jurisdiction. What's important to notice about building codes is that they, the catch point, the point at which a building or builder becomes subject to the code is typically one of two moments. A, they want to open a new building or commission it, in which case they must meet the new building standards, or they make changes such as remodeling or changes in use of a building that is sufficiently substantial that it triggers the requirement for code compliance. So while cities are typically the jurisdictional authority that adopts statewide building codes, they, um, they don't get to just pronounce it for all buildings. They catch the buildings as they come to them. So when a new building is built, again, or where you have a substantial remodeling, then the latest code version will apply. 
Stretch codes are an innovation in several states and city and or cities, which are codes that are more stringent and provide better performance on environmental and other purposes than is required by the minimum. Many states are promulgating stretch codes and cities are deciding to follow them. The, the, the thing about stretch codes is that we can do things like require new buildings to be solar ready or to require them to be ready for electrical appliances that in the past we may have relied upon as gas. Um, so stretch codes are a way of going above and beyond the minimum requirements and making your city stand out. Um, the next idea is carbon utilities. Cities have the authority to provide through funding and regulation opportunities for carbon systems. Boulder uh, was starting down the road of creating a carbon utility that would operate alongside its electric and gas utilities. Um, and the idea is not totally gone and may even be a good way to uh, advance decarbonization. Development means that in building, you have to address some kind of problem somewhere else. Um, in some cases, these are mechanisms used by cities to ensure that only the cleanest and greenest new buildings are added to the city footprint. Um, in Austin, Texas, for example, when I worked for the utility, when somebody wanted to build a building that was, say, one or two stories higher than the allowed amount, we would consider allowing that if they also adopted the greenest, the best platinum level green building standard that we could get them to adopt. So um, managing zoning approvals, zoning variations, siting and building permits is a tool to allow the development to go above and beyond. Um, finally, the last two, cities have taxing authority. They can decide how to tax things subject to state law, much longer discussion. They can also provide incentives, either alone or in coordination with city, with uh, gas utilities. And then finally, they can use the power of moral suasion. They can have conversations, they can set the tone, and they can create an expectation for levels of performance, including decarbonization. Okay. I've run through all that uh, pretty quickly. There's a thank you slide with some more contact information. Let me turn things over to John. Um, so I just wanted to give some background about, you know, overall why this is important to focus on gas. Carl gave some really good overall issues about climate pollution, but I just wanted to flag that in particular, as cities are looking at commitments to clean energy, as states are doing more around clean energy, that this issue of gas is becoming more of an issue. So this slide I borrowed from the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, I tried to highlight the Midwest here, compares uh, the emissions, or the, sorry, the fuel economy uh, equivalent of an electric vehicle. So it's basically a proxy for how clean is the electricity grid in, in a state. And what you can see is between 2009 and 2016, generally the numbers went up, which is to say the energy grids in those states became less carbon intensive. Unfortunately, I noticed there was at least one place where it went down. Uh, but that's Wisconsin and we forgive you because we know why. Um, so uh, the idea here though was to sort of give some sense of uh, things in the electricity system are generally getting cleaner because renewable energy uh, electricity production is so inexpensive uh, and, and we have an opportunity here. Uh, and this is highlighted in terms of uh, some stuff that has come up in Minneapolis recently. So Minneapolis is one of many cities that have made climate goals, uh, has a climate action plan, has made commitments to 100% renewable energy. And that recently there was this story published in the Star Tribune here uh, at the end of last month, uh, the major newspaper serving Minneapolis, uh, that the stubborn foe that the city is facing is gas. Um, and it had several quotes from city officials saying essentially, uh, we are doing a great job decarbonizing in terms of electricity through investments the city's making in clean energy and that residents and businesses are doing in solar. Uh, we're having a lot harder time with gas. And there was this chart that they shared, uh, not in that story, but as part of uh, a report to um, the Energy Vision Advisory Committee that helps advise uh, one of their clean energy initiatives to look at essentially what's happening. So you can see here, it goes back about 10 years 
and that electricity used to be by far a much larger contributor of greenhouse gas emissions for the city and that it has recently flipped. And based on projections from the city's uh, electric company, in the long run, uh, electric emissions are gonna be a much smaller fraction of the city's greenhouse gas emissions uh, than natural gas, um, unfortunately. And so the city looking ahead to reaching its climate goals is saying, this is an issue that we have to wrestle with. So it's, uh, you know, we have to figure out what powers do we have to address this problem because from the standpoint of meeting our climate goals, we have to do something about gas. So what can cities do? Uh, Carl, I think, gave a really good overview of all the different powers that cities have. I'm going to cover a few in a little bit more detail, uh, especially with, uh, relevant to things that are already happening uh, and that I think, therefore, city officials are more likely to jump onto. So one of these is around banning new hookups uh, to the gas system. And there's actually two parts of the country where this is happening for interesting and different reasons. One is in Berkeley, California. And if you tune in to the Local Energy Rules podcast, uh, our, one of our upcoming episodes, I think will be in early October, is an interview with a city council member from Berkeley, California, because that's the city ordinance that they just passed that will not allow any new home uh, constructed in Berkeley to have a natural gas hookup. And what's fascinating is we also had on the call an affordable housing developer who was talking about enormous savings in terms of health because of indoor air quality issues with gas appliances, but also that it's cheaper to build housing without gas hookups uh, in California uh, and creates more, more affordable housing and lower energy bills for customers. Now that's not true necessarily everywhere in the country, but he works outside of California and many other states. And so there were sort of two really interesting reasons uh, that the city had approached this ban. And in particular, I think it's fascinating that I really expected them to talk mostly about climate change as the reason for doing this, but health was really the focus. And there's some resources that will be up on the show page for that podcast interview that talk more about some of the health issues that they discussed on that interview. So this is one way that cities are just starting to engage in around gas. And the idea is let's catch new, in, new uh, properties as they're being built uh, and basically stop the expansion of the gas network. Uh, it's actually happening in New York for, as I mentioned, slightly different reasons, which is the state regulators have been holding back on approving an expansion to an existing gas pipeline. And as a result, the gas utility said uh, that it won't hook up any new customers because it's not sure it will have enough supply for them. And that again is then requiring, in that case, the utility is taking the action, but it's requiring the cities to react to that. And many are kind of seizing on this as an opportunity to promote more electrification in buildings. So two interesting places things are happening, but uh, in California is where it's starting from, uh, starting from the city itself. Um, another one is looking at permitting fees. And this comes with an asterisk that I should have included on the slide, which is it also requires good enforcement. But you have all these different kinds of gas appliances that are installed in homes and businesses, and you almost always have to pull a permit uh, to install them. And uh, cities have a permit fee associated with pulling that permit. Um, there are lots of different ways that cities set those permit fees. I could refer you to a lot of uh, uh, written material about solar, for example, about whether sometimes it's based on the actual cost to the city to issue the permit. Sometimes the city's permitting department is a way that they raise a little extra revenue, uh, or it could be tied to, in some fashion, greenhouse gas emissions um, a, a, as a way for the city to have more money to respond to and mitigate emissions from other sources. But at any rate, the city does have authority over permitting for appliance installations. Uh, and if they have good enforcement to ensure that people follow those rules, have an opportunity to use their permitting authority uh, to address installation of gas appliances. So for example, um, I have had some conversations with city officials, not on the record, sadly, about um, considering doing like, starting in 2025, we won't permit a new gas appliance uh, of a certain kind, whether it's a furnace or a gas stove or, or what have you. Um, there's also this opportunity to look at franchise fees. So uh, cities have franchises, and Carl referenced these uh, agreements with utilities in many different states. And uh, ILSR has done a fairly uh, significant survey of US states looking at where they have the authority, in fact, to collect a fee on, in this case, we were looking at electric utility bills, but it's often similar for the gas utility. Um, the one thing that's 
not covered very well in this map, but is in a little more detail in the post that we wrote about it, is that sometimes the fee is set at the state level. So the city has the authority to collect the fee, but not to set it. Um, but that being said, uh, cities have been able to use franchise fees, increasing these fees to fund a number of different things. Some of them fund road uh, construction. Some of them are funding clean energy activity, as you see in this article here about Minneapolis. Um, but it could also be used as a deterrent uh, for using gas. So the franchise fee is usually passed through as essentially a local tax on gas or electricity. And by increasing the cost of gas, you could uh, incentivize people to install things like air source heat pumps that use electricity rather than gas furnaces. So helping to address some of the economic issues and economic incentives for customers. Um, you can advocate for residents and businesses. So cities uh, are often absent at public utilities commissions, these state regulatory arenas where important decisions are made about uh, how uh, policy is, energy policy is being set. Um, the city of Minneapolis, uh, through support from a foundation, uh, recently hired a regulatory person who is now intervening at the state's utilities commission on some of these interesting issues. So intervening in a utility resource plan to sort of ask questions about, hey, does this plan align with promises that the utility has made around climate change to our city? Does it align with the city's own goals around climate change? Uh, does the expansion of the gas network that is being proposed by this utility on this particular docket align with our state's greenhouse gas emission goals? So cities have a real unique opportunity to stand in for residents and businesses that probably don't have the time or expertise uh, to spend uh, at the uh, Utilities Commission. And so uh, we're seeing a rise in interest there of cities playing that role of intervening there. Um, and that can include, for example, Carl mentioned stretch codes. In Minnesota, we have seen a number of cities that have climate action plans working together uh, with legislators and with state regulators to say, we need a stretch code available to allow our city to push building energy codes further than the normally adopted state code to, to help us read our climate action goals. Um, so that's just one example of a way that cities uh, can use that power and, and use that and provide that expertise on behalf of their residents and businesses. Um, another one here is around fuel price, rice, fuel price risk sharing. I should have actually included the map about the states that do this, but what is often the case uh, both for gas distribution utilities, but also for electric utilities that have gas power plants is that all of the risk of the fluctuations in gas prices is borne by customers. Uh, for utilities, it's often uh, there's like a fuel clause pass through that just says, hey, gas prices went up this month and here's the cost of it for customers. Um, even though the utility had some skin in the game in deciding to build that power plant that uses gas or that the gas utility has some role to play in the amount of energy that's consumed based on, for example, investments it makes in its conservation programs. And there are a number of states that have moved to uh, different policies around fuel price risk sharing. So this here is an illustration of one potential way that you could do it, where you would say, hey, when a utility builds a new gas power plant, um, uh, if its fuel price forecast is off by a lot, that the shareholders of that utility, if it's a privately owned utility, uh, would pay a portion of that uh, high cost of gas rather than customers bearing uh, the significant, uh, all of the risk. So this is sort of, think of this as like uh, having uh, emergency health insurance. Uh, you know, or catastrophic insurance for serious illnesses. You're still going to be responsible for the co-pays for your regular doctor visits, for prescriptions, that kind of thing. But should you get in a horrible car accident and need surgery, this would help cover you. And the same way here, this is an insurance policy for uh, customers of the utility saying the utility shareholders who are the ones who benefit from the investments the utility makes will take on some of that risk and protect customers uh, if fuel prices rise much more than was expected or forecast. And this can be used both for gas utilities and for electric utilities. Um, ILSR has done some additional work on this and so if folks have more questions about it, I encourage you to follow up offline. So that's all I have to offer. Um, this is really seen, uh, as Abby mentioned, as a potential jumping off point for a reamp action team that would do some more work on identifying these local strategies, talking with some cities in the reamp footprint, maybe ones that have similarly made 100% renewable energy commitments about their interest in this and what they would need to know. But basically, you know, starting this conversation uh, in, in the Midwest about 
gas as this leading climate problem and trying to identify ways that cities are both interested in and have the power to affect gas use. So I uh, wanted to offer one last thing before I wrap up, which is that ILSR did just publish uh, this Community Power Interactive Toolkit. Uh, it provides a lot of different strategies that cities can use to address climate change uh, through a story format. Uh, we have audio from our podcast, some short videos, a lot of photos. Uh, it takes everything from explaining why cities set, set off on doing a particular policy step to often including the ordinance language that they adopted. So happy to share this uh, and get any feedback folks have from it. But uh, as I said, looking to use this webinar as a launching off point for continuing this investigation uh, through the REAMP network. Thank you. Thank you. you know, um, John, since we've got a few extra minutes, maybe I can jump in with a little bit of a, a, a real world story about gas and municipalities too. Um, up until a, about a month and a half ago, I lived in White Plains, which is in Westchester County, New York, just north of the city. Uh, the only city uh, that that they know of, New York City. But at any rate, uh, the, um, the the local gas utility, Con Ed, wanted to build some new pipeline and uh, wanted the regulators to let them put the cost of developing their pipeline proposal on ratepayers. Um, the commission said um, the commission said they were not. Excuse me, I'm being interrupted <laughs> by the boss. Um, the, anyway, the commission said, no, we're not going to let you automatically put those costs through. So the utility declared a moratorium on new gas connections, which sounds like, hey, victory, if, you know, except. And this is the part of the story that's really important. Um, the manner in which it happened was so sudden and abrupt that it brought out every local and county level elected official in Westchester County to protest the moratorium on new gas connections. Um, and if you look behind it, what really kind of comes out is that real estate development is sort of mother's milk of local politics. New buildings, new businesses, new homes, are what localities are all about. That's how they measure their economic well-being. And so when the builders came to them and said, you know, OMG, I can't open my new building because I won't be able to get gas service for it, um, it yielded a real backlash. Now, there are ways out of this, but they require prior planning and not abrupt changes. It requires things like at the very earliest possible stage of new development or remodeling, there has to be a conversation about how to reduce or if possible, avoid new requirements for gas. Um, one idea that we floated in Westchester County out of Pace Energy and Climate Center was a zero net gas policy as an interim step on the road to decarbonization. But well, we said that the, the city and the, the cities and the utilities should do is say that any new gas requirement had to more than offset its requirement by reductions or elimination of other gas uses. Um, the idea is that there's a huge amount of inefficient gas use, especially in low income homes and neighborhoods that is contributing to bad health and air pollution. And we could use a zero net gas approach as a method for starting, for stopping the growth of gas use, for starting the targeting of inefficient gas use, and not having it devolve into a yes, no, uh, growth as usual, or no growth at all kind of false debate. So, Anyway, that's a quick summary. There's a lot more to it. We can share more information, but I did want to put on the table for those thinking about sort of action in their cities that um, just to keep in mind some political realities and the fact that there are alternatives, but it requires foresight and it requires a commitment. 
thank you so much, John and Carl. Um, I'm gonna open it up. People on the webinar watching, um, you can't speak. So the best way to ask questions is to put it in the chat box or uh, use the Q&A function. So if anyone has any questions, topics of discussion, wants to share stories that they're seeing in their own communities, um, please do so now. And I just wanted to go back, Carl, you broke up a little bit when you were talking about um, carbon utility. Can you explain that a little more again? Yes. So, you know, the idea is that um, what a city could do is establish a utility function that, that would help finance and invest in carbon reduction. And it would be a utility that, that could pay for its work by the savings that were realized. So one way to do it would be just, you know, enact a municipal carbon tax, right? And avoiding the tax or the revenues from the tax could be used to finance and fund measures to re eliminate or reduce carbon use. So you'd have a virtuous circle where the tax would disappear once the community was decarbonized but that you'd be having you'd be having tax on the thing that you, and because you'd be having tax on the thing that you want to eliminate, it's not likely that an electric utility or a gas utility would want to do this. Although if they were progressive and thoughtful, they could add it as a new business line, just like progressive and thoughtful utilities are adding energy efficiency on the, both the gas and the electric side. Um, but a city could buy a sort of a sidestep utility recalcitrance by setting up their own municipal carbon authority um, that could seed it with bond funding if they needed some cash at the very start. Or like I said, they could impose a tax that would act as a source of funds and again, be self-eliminating once the community Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Everyone's just patiently watching. You know, uh, Abby, it's, while we're waiting for questions, I will also mention one other thing that's starting to show up. We were talking about it in the 90s and it went away with fracking because gas prices have been so low, but it's coming back with communities focusing on decarbonization and that's gas efficiency. You know, just the people in the electricity world are familiar with DSM, demand side management, efficiency and conservation measures. There are bunches of things we can do to make our gas use more efficient. Appliance replacement, old appliances are much less efficient than modern appliances and modern appliances are safer than old appliances. Um, there are uh, there is such a thing as gas demand response, meaning curtailing gas use at times when gas prices are very high. That helps reduce the drive for new pipelines uh, and expanded pipelines to carry more gas. Just like the electric system, the gas business is driven by peak demand. Uh, what makes it a little tougher is that gas peaks are 24 hours long. They're a whole day long, so it's, it's a little tougher. And then finally, there's been a lot of discussion about mixing electrification and what we call non-pipeline solutions. So at the time when the gas utility is saying, hey, I need a new pipeline, I need, or I need access to a new gas transmission line, what you can put on the table is, what about electric heat pumps? What about uh, um, heat pump water heaters? What about non-pipeline solutions to the demand for heating services that could also rely on electrification? And then take advantage of John's slide that shows that that electricity is gonna be increasingly renewable and it's a win, win, win. You reduce urban air pollution, you reduce dependence on volatile natural gas, and you increase your use of renewable electricity. So gas energy efficiency, gas DSM, 
and, and thinking about conservation and efficiency in gas, um, there's a lot of good work to be done there. Um, I guess, John, for you, you know, you both talked about there's so many solutions, it seems, that, that you can put together and make into uh, meaningful action. And when you're thinking about um, taking action, like in the form of an action team with REAMP, is there any one uh, solution you're looking to really focus on or are you trying to do a mix of things within certain places? I think it's definitely a mix because not all of the policies will kind of address all of the issues around equitable deep decarbonization. You know, I think Carl highlighted how, you know, that net zero net gas policy is an intriguing one because it aligns uh, investments in new efficient uses with um, helping to reduce energy costs and improve health for low income residents. Um, I think you, you know, if you just have a ban on new hookups, for example, you don't necessarily get that benefit of tying together the two. Um, uh, that being said, I think you probably do need to look at long term the fact that you are going to have to fuel switch folks and get them off the gas network. Um, and so something like a carbon utility or a franchise fee increase or something that helps narrow that cost differential for those new technologies, but also just kind of helps people, you know, one of the things that we're going to encounter is that we need we need that fuel switching to start happening really soon because the problem is that when you put in a new furnace or other gas infrastructure, it can last for a long time. I mean, my furnace in my house is 22 years old already. It's a gas furnace and I'll have it inspected again this fall, but I suspect it will continue to run for a little while longer. And, uh, you know, not only do I, what I, as an average customer, appreciate an incentive to switch to a heat pump, but I also would want maybe the city helps do like an extended warranty or something like that for people who are adopting new technologies. Uh, maybe that's a possible use for the funds. Or maybe we're trying to get them in, you know, public housing or other places where city is already putting money in potentially. And the city is then helping backstop those investments to make sure that they work. You know, we need lots of interesting ways to both deploy the technology, help those early adopters feel comfortable given that, you know, in a Northern climate, especially as most Midwest cities are, that there is generally a lot of heavy use in the winter and, um, uh, and we need to make sure that those things work well. So I, I think it's gonna be a mix. I think my goal would be the action team is uh, thinking about, uh, is working on, how, let's get in touch with cities that have made climate commitments. Let's just invite them to a conversation you know, talk for an hour about what are they doing around gas? Are they interested in trying to address these issues? What would they like to, you know, here's some ideas that we have, you know, how to maybe it might align with things they're already doing in their like climate action planning or energy efficiency work, that kind of thing. Uh, really just starting the conversation. And as we go through that, then maybe able to figure out a little bit more what it is that uh, cities are looking for, find out if there's more research that needs to be done, you know, connections to be made between technical groups and cities to be able to answer questions, that kind of thing. You know, let me add, I see we have a question, but let me just add one important point to what John just said. Um, the first thing everybody needs to do is probably do your homework. That AGA link that I had on the slide where I listed the miles and number of services, it actually breaks down distribution infrastructure by more than 1400 different cities or gas utilities. And it also breaks down all that infrastructure by the kind of infrastructure. So it tells you whether it's a steel pipe or plastic pipe. It also tells you what year that equipment was installed. Keep in mind that gas distribution infrastructure can have a useful life that easily north of 50 years, typically 85 years for a piece of pipe. Um, so understanding the vintage of the system that you're living with is a is valuable first step in being able to, to advocate effectively about reducing infrastructure costs and not buying into another eight decades worth of gas depreciation expenses at your local gas utility. I want to just add, Carl, on that note that uh, this... Uh, gas utility serving Minneapolis is currently replacing mains literally in front of my house. And I have had thinking about that in preparation for this webinar that 
those mains are probably designed to last 80 years. And I know that by the time I'm done living in that house, I'm hoping they're not using it anymore. Right. Uh, in order for us to be what it would call stranded assets. And the utilities are going to be complaining about having to recover those costs because they thought they'd be collecting for 80 years, when in reality, they can only collect for another 10 or 20 before we have to decarbonize at most, right? So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a real concern about throwing good money after bad. The, what really applies in gas infrastructure is the first law of holes, which is if you're in a hole and you want to get out, stop digging. <laughs> and so that's what we have to do with gas infrastructure. So I see a, a question yep. for me and then for John. So I'll start with mine. Um, for me, Michelle is wondering if the zero net gas policy would be additional to existing utility efficiency requirements um, like uh, CIP, which is an acronym I don't know, but a conservation and, and, and anyway, programs, incentive programs in Minnesota. Uh, and, and the answer is yes. What the, what the zero net gas approach can do is actually act as a driver for success in those energy efficiency programs, right? So um, it probably makes sense to impose a zero net gas policy on the utility and to say you will connect new load, new gas load, only if you offset it, but we'll give you encouragement through your energy, your gas efficiency programs. Uh, so coordinating those together makes really good sense and layering it on top. And that way, instead of just depending on the utility to say, hey, I think I can save, you know, a million BTUs or a million decatherms, they actually have a specific target, which is zero net gas, in the in the context of all the economic development, real estate development that we want to have happen in our communities, so I see them as very complementary and acting and ZNG acting as a driver for better performance on those efficiency programs. I'll just quickly address the second part of that question about franchise agreements and just say. Um, uh, I don't know that I totally understand the question here, Michelle, but. Um, would just say that in general with franchise agreements, when cities set the fee, they kind of decide where the money goes. And so if that's for subsidizing heat pumps or extended insurance or whatever it might be, um, let's say it would be up to the city to decide how to use that revenue. Um, it, I think also you mentioned inclusive financing or the kind of the pay as you save model. Uh, ILSR has been working on this along with other organizations on this policy. The idea is basically just making it easier to finance energy improvements in homes. And uh, I think the opportunity there is that we don't have to tie this to conservation programs explicitly, and we can certainly use that kind of financing tool to encourage people to do fuel switching, to you know go to gas from gas to electric. So uh, I'm gonna leave it there because I'm interested in this next question in particular, if Carl has an answer to it uh, about how you sort of decommission the gas network. Yep, yeah, I'm sorry, just let me add one other point real quick. You need to probably consult with a municipal tax attorney um, thinking about these fees and stuff. Some states have pretty rigorous laws about the purposes for which revenues collected through taxes and charges can be used and whether or not there needs to be a, a connection between the problem you're solving and the cause and the tax you're in, or fee you're imposing. Um, city lawyers will know this inside out. They live with it every single day. Um, you, may want, you, you may want to start by just asking them and then looking at other legal specialists in city finance law. So um, you, gotta, there's, you know there's a lawyer has to be involved. So Julie asked this other question, which is, what are the operational implications of slowly shutting off meters as individual customers transition as opposed to whole segments of mains at once? Um, so there's, it's a technical question about pressure and keeping pressure up. Um, and I'm not smart enough to answer the gas engineering question, but it does make sense that 
you know, if you've got a main serving a hundred customers, um, if you get it down to just one customer, that's an awful lot of cost on that one customer being served by a main design for a one for one. It also means that the pressure on that line would um, would be different and probably be reduced to serve only one customer. Um, I don't know what the implications are for that, but it's the right kind of technical question. My guess is that um, some of the thinking we use on concepts like microgrids would apply, where we'd look for clusters of customers that could be empowered with non-gas dependence at the same time. After all, that's how the gas system is built out, right? They extend a main, they connect a suburb or a development in a suburb, or they connect a new building in the city. So unwinding it in the same chunk by chunk way makes economic intuitive sense to me, even if I don't understand the engineering. <laughs> John, do you know anything about this? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're money and policy nerds. Um, consultant engineer, I suppose. Um, and also don't take any answer at face value. You know, there's been a whole lot of uh, utility people telling us that we couldn't connect rooftop solar without bringing down the whole grid. And that's being proven untrue every day. Michelle, do either of you have thoughts on whether power to gas is relevant in the U.S. at all? It's being talked about in Europe and the economics of stacking are much different here. I'm not familiar with the term power to gas. John, do you know what that is? I, I would assume that it means like electrolysis for hydrogen. Um, but uh, so that, that's my one familiarity with it. I actually just saw a Twitter thread on it yesterday and the cost is generally the issue in terms of whether or not that kind of technology is competitive, but also sort of in terms of delivery uh, and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think in general, power to gas is gonna be an interesting possible way of essentially storing electricity at a large site, but it's not gonna be a distributed strategy. Uh, and it's certainly not gonna depend on competing with pipeline gas at cost, it's gonna, we're gonna require other policies. Um, I know we're just about at time. I don't, Abby, I don't know if you want us to try to take another question or not. Um, let's just try just one more from Marcus. Um, what way do you see to use the zero net gas model and others to incentivizing gas utilities to energy services companies, uh, energy efficiency work, et cetera, in the end as we transition away from carbon? Yeah, I, I, I think the idea of a zero net gas is it's a trans, it is a transition mechanism. It's a framing that says, um, for now, we're not saying no to all new gas. So it's a little less severe than the Berkeley approach. It says, we will accept new gas connections, but first, you have to try to eliminate the use of gas at all. Second, any gas use that you do have has to be as efficient as possible. And third, any remaining gas demand has to be more than offset with reductions in gas elsewhere in the system. So it basically says, just stop driving, stop the driver for new infrastructure, because that's that's the pathology of gas system expansion, right? A few new customers, you have to build a new gas main, you got a gas main, you got to serve a few more customers. It's, um, you know, it, it feeds itself. So the idea of ZNG is that it, it stops the growth and says we need to start working backwards and use economic development as the driver for that. And then the fact that the utility has to find offsetting reductions focuses their mind and has them like a kind of a cap and trade system, it focuses their mind on finding the most economical reductions in gas use that they can find, um, which we also can incentivize for getting inefficient gas use out of economically and environmentally disadvantaged communities as well. So we can add a justice aspect to it. 
too. Um, I can provide more information, by the way. We're writing this up and have written up some summary versions. So use the contact information, reach out to me, and I'll share that way as well.